great epistle of Paul. Colossians 2, 6 through 7. By the way, as you're turning there, we think about the solid rock and the sifting sand. I've been trying to read through the works of John Flavel, <clears throat> which will take me about 10 years, I think. But nevertheless, um, he said the problem today is, is that most people want to put one, rock, one foot on the rock and one foot in the sand. He said those people still fall over in the end. <laughs> Instead of rock or sand, they want to straddle, if you will, but they still will fall over. Uh, we must have both feet, the entirety of our being and lives, planted upon Christ, the solid rock, if we want to have any hope of standing to the end. Colossians 2, just verse 6 and verse 7, that, that is all today. Therefore, <clears throat> as you received Christ Jesus the Lord... So walk in Him. You can say, so live in Him. Rooted, built up in Him, established in the faith, just as you were taught, abounding in thanksgiving. All right, let me read one more time and uh, do a little bit different with these uh, verbs in verse 7. Let's say, say it like this. Therefore, as you have received Christ Jesus the Lord, so you must live in Him. It's a command. You must live in Him. Rooted, being built up in Him, being established in the faith just as you were taught, abounding in thanksgiving. Father, we thank You for this, Your Word this morning, and we pray that You would help us Teach us and guide us as how to live a Christ-centered life. How is it, God, that I, that this church body, how is it that we can live a life that is centered upon the Lord Jesus Christ, the King of glory? How is it that our lives can be dedicated, focused, and sold out unto Him? Lord, help us to grasp that this morning. And Father, as we think upon the concept of receiving Christ Jesus the Lord, May we reflect on how it is that we received him, whether we received him rightly or not. And for those that are even in this very room that have not received him, perhaps today, God, you would open their eyes and their ears and their heart to understand these things and they would receive the person, the Lord Jesus Christ, and all that he means for their life. I pray, God, that you'd have your way with these things. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Well, just to kind of help you, uh, if you've not noticed, I just want to bring this to your attention. Paul does this all of the time. To this point has been his introduction. So if we're just reading the letter rightly, chapter 1, verse 1, through chapter 2, verse 5, is simply Paul's introduction. It's just introducing who he is, his position upon Christ, and he's laying these things out, and we saw in the last few weeks his heart his desire to minister unto these people and the people at Laodicea. So the thing that we learn about Paul, whether it's in Ephesians or Colossians or anything else he writes, when Paul takes the time to unfold theology, when he takes the time to give you his position regarding God, regarding Jesus, regarding some topic or doctrine that he's dealing with, it never stops there for Paul. It always has an application. So if Paul is going to take the time to tell you what Colossians 1, 15 through 20 says, that he is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation, and so forth, if he's going to tell you who Jesus is, he's going to tell you what Jesus has done, I assure you he's then going to apply it, and you're going to have to do something with it. You're going to have to accept that, receive that, respond to that in some way. Okay, that's the way Paul does. You can't have theology, what we believe about God, what we believe about Jesus, what we believe about doctrine. You cannot have that and then not have it apply to your personal life. If you do that, you have a bunch of head knowledge, but no life application. So all of what Paul has said, it's really been glorious, especially 11 through 15. I hope that will stay on my heart and mind for the rest of my life, the rest of eternity. What he has said is rich, it's deep, and it's good. I especially love that part that I was an alien, 
that I was hostile in mind and I was doing evil deeds, but he reconciled me to himself. I really love that. Man, that just blessed my heart to know what Christ has done to save my soul. And so we can glory in all of that, but what does it mean for me today? How, how does that rich, deep thought of Jesus, how does it affect me this day, tomorrow, and every day of my life? Does it affect me? Does it affect you? Is it simply what we talk about in a church setting on a Sunday, or does it affect the entirety of my life on days that end in a while? It ought to, because we're talking of the Lord of glory who's sovereign over all things, and he has created you to be a worshiper of him. In, in our religiosity, sometimes we want to separate I'm just, I'm just trying to open this up for you, but we, we want to separate, and I want to put on my religious mask on Sunday. I want to sing, I want to hear a sermon, and I want to pray, and I want to have some level of religiosity where my conscience will feel better. But tomorrow's a work day. Tomorrow I get up at five, and tomorrow I have to go to my job, and I've got to move on with my life. Do you? And tomorrow I have this, 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 and this, and so I'll get my church in, but tomorrow I've got to put my interest and devotion somewhere else. Do you? Do, do you really? Or is it actually so that if I have a right understanding of Christ, that He will affect what I do tomorrow? That He'll affect the way I work he will affect the way I make my decisions. He will affect the way that I treat those that I'm around. He will affect every aspect of everything I do on Monday as much as, if not more so, than on Sunday. Now, I'm not simply meddling for your entertainment. I'm trying to bring back to your attention that Jesus Christ desires the whole of your life. Not, not, he's not a, I don't have, a, he's not a, a necklace that you wear. He's not a shirt from Lifeway that says some religious slogan. He's not a rabbit's foot in your pocket. He's not a good luck charm. It's not something I add to my life to cover my basis. That's not who he is. He is the Lord of glory. He is the king. He demands the entirety of of your life. He's the king. Does the king not have such a demand? He demands absolute loyalty because he is the king. So in the introduction, Paul has given us a, a wealth of theology, but I notice in all of that 1-1 one, one through 2-5, there's not one command. Not one. No command, you must, jump, go, stop. There's not one command in the introduction, none. But when we get to 2-6, we get our first command, and then we get a boatload of them after that. Now we're going to take that theology, and we're going to apply it. You must live in Him. You must. It's an absolute command from the king and the sovereign potentate of the entire world. You're in Christ, you must live in Christ. And then he's going to tell us how to live in Christ. Rooted, being built up, being established, and abounding in thanksgiving. That's how I live in Christ. I am a person who has my roots in Christ, if you will, they keep going deeper and wider and getting more stability. That's who I am in Christ, and my roots are getting more and more rooted as time goes on. And I'm being built up more and more solid day after day after day, and I'm being established. I know what I believe. I know what I believe. I may not have it all right, but I know what I believe. And I'm going to know it more next week. And so are you. That's what Christians do. When I first came to the Lord, there was a lot of things I was unsure of. There's still some things I'm unsure of. Probably a lot of them. But there's some things I've worked out, and I've got an establishment there that says, look, come hell or high water, and every voice under the sun can come tell me something different, but I'm establishing this. I know that Jesus Christ is the only way to heaven. 
I got that one. I, I know this. He's the only redeemer. There's, there's some things I've been established in in my faith. And I'm not tempted to buy this idea or that idea. I am convinced that two plus two is four. I mean, it's just, I, I'm just not, not going to give on that point. Why? Because there's only one answer to that equation. There's only one answer for going to glory, and it's Jesus. You can ask me that at two in the morning, and I'm still going to get that one right. Even if I'm not prepared for the question. And how else am I going to live this Christ-centered life? I'm going to be abounding, overflowing, exceeding, outdoing myself in thanksgiving. I am thankful. Are you thankful? I am thankful specifically for what I've been taught by the Word of God, by men of God, by people of God, the things that have been opened to me from God's Word that have touched my heart. I'm thankful. I am thankful that in a world of over 6 billion people, I know Christ. I mean, you ought to be thankful about that. Do you realize this morning there's a whole lot of people don't know Him and a whole lot more people don't even care who He is? You ought to be thankful that he has revealed himself to you. I'm thankful for him. I'm thankful for the local church. I'm thankful for the beauty of the doctrines that I've been taught over the years. And it is a blessing to my soul. Man, ought to be thankful about that and continue to be thankful for the rest of my life. He has done the greatest thing that could ever be done for my soul. He's forgiven me. He's given me life. He's raised me from the dead. He's brought me together in relation to him and adopted me, and I'm an heir with Christ Jesus. Somehow, I think we should not get over that. We ought to abound in thanksgiving. Now, in a sense, just trying to touch on those things, but let me give you this quote in regards to this person of Christ. He said this way, it's the Puritans. They say, I am hungry and athirst. And Christ is meat indeed and drink indeed. This is the best thing in all the world for me because so necessary and so suitable to the needs of a soul that is ready to perish. I am a law-condemned and self-condemned sinner trembling for fear of the execution of the curse upon me every moment. In Christ is complete righteousness to justify my soul. In Christ is complete righteousness to justify my soul. Oh, there is nothing better for me than Christ. What a position. Person before privilege that we would receive the person, the Lord Jesus Christ. Oh, how good it is for me. Here's what some people, they talk, and it's like, oh, I can't wait to go to heaven. Oh, I want to go to heaven. Oh, streets of gold. Oh, pearly gates. Oh, mansion on the hillside. Oh, I want to go to heaven. Great, but the scriptures say, he is higher than the heavens. Let us press on to him. Let us know the person before we get caught up in the privileges, if you will. The beginning of my text says this, as, therefore, as you have received him. Therefore, as you have received him. Now the question is here, and I just want you to ponder it this morning. I want you to allow that to soak in. I'm ask questions. Just trying to joggle your mind, pull at your heart just a little bit. First of all, have you? As you have received him, have you? Have you received him is one of the most pressing questions you need to answer this day for your own soul. You can say all manner of things to me and someone else or whatever, but at the end of the day, have you received Christ? makes little difference whether you can convince me or not because I am not the one you must fear. You must fear him who can destroy both body and soul in hell. So have you received him? But our text says not only does it bring out this idea of receiving, but he says just as you received. So my question is this, how did you receive him? How, how did you receive him? 
What type of reception was that? What did you believe about Christ? How did you take Christ into your life, if you will? You say, well, it was by faith. Well, by faith, what did you believe? Because herein lies a very grave difficulty in religiosity. How so? Some people receive Christ simply as a ticket. I just don't want to go to hell. That's good. I don't want to go to hell either. I don't want anybody to go to hell. That's a bad deal. So did you just receive him as a ticket out of hell? Did you receive Christ in order that your conscience would quit screaming at you? You felt bad when the preacher preached. You felt a little concern when the Word of God was read. You went to a place and they prayed and you felt uneasy and you thought, man, my life's not right. You, you were around at the 911 thing and you got scared and you thought, oh my goodness, here comes this great uh, end of the planet and all the computers are going to shut down at the end of the year. And You got caught up in a moment of desperation and you're just like, I just received Christ to make sure I had my bases covered. People do that. At the end of John 2, many people believed on him. They received or believed on him, but Jesus didn't believe in them. There's a lot of people who will believe because of something Jesus might do for them, but is that the way that we're supposed to receive Christ? Now, some people receive Christ and it's limited in scope, and I just want to broaden your scope out just a bit. I just want to bring the thing out a little bit wider. How did you receive Christ? You say, I truly knew I had sinned against God. I knew that I deserved to go to hell. I knew that, and I believed on Him because He's the only one who can save me. Praise the Lord. That's good because he's the only one that can save you. You say, well, I, I believed on him because he died on the cross for me. Good. That's good right. That's, that's right on. You ought to believe on him because he died on the cross. I, I believe because he rose from the dead. He ascended back to heaven. I, I believe these things about Christ in order that I could be saved. Fair enough. Fair enough, as Barry King would say. I didn't come here to quibble over words. He said, that's fair enough. What I want us to see is that Christ is is more than that. Here's one of the dangers that happens in church, it seems all of the time. You have people that will turn, believe, or receive Christ, but they only believe Christ can help them in the sense of salvation. He can save my soul. He can forgive me of my sins. And when I die, he can take me home. Do you know Christ is larger than that? People get confronted with the difficulties of life. Tragedies happen. Cataclysmic things affect our world. Hurricanes come. Tornadoes come. Cancer strikes almost every family that we know in some regard. We have things that happen outside of our control. Are things that our flesh cannot handle. Our mind cannot handle. We don't know how to deal with it. Listen. We don't know how to deal with it. So we have to do something. We do something. Whether you believe my, 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 my logic here or not, you do something when you don't know what to do. Sleep it off. Drink it off. Psychologize it to death. You do something with it. You get angry, you get sad, you get very talkative, or you go and eat to comfort yourself by eating too much. Or you don't eat anything because you feel so sick you don't want to eat. We all respond to the difficulties of life in some way. Some of us call a friend. Some of us respond by not talking to anybody. Some of us go on a drive. Some of us put on spandex and ride a bicycle. Just try to work it out of your system. We all respond in some way. I know it may sound like I've lost my text, but I haven't. Just as you have received him. Church, what I want to remind you is, is if you receive Christ rightly, the Christ you received and the way you received him and who you received, that's who you're to live in. 
So when all of those things happen that are beyond my control that I'm not reacting to rightly, here's an idea. Why don't you go back to Christ where you started? Why don't we go there? You mean to tell me you think Christ is able to do the greatest thing redeem your soul from hell and adopt you into the family of God, but he can't handle all the lesser things like the loss of your job, like the running away of a rebellious kid, like some kind of uh, medical exam that you didn't pass. You, you think Christ can redeem your eternal soul, but he can't deal with you being diagnosed with cancer? You mean to tell me that Christ is not sufficient to be able to help you when you don't have money at the end of the month? You mean to tell me that Christ is not able to help your depression? You mean to tell me that the King of glory has no answer for depression? You mean to tell me that the psychologist got it right and Jesus is in the fog? You, you mean to tell me Jesus is scratching his head going, my children are depressed and I just don't know what to do. Is that the case of your Christ? As you have received him, then you must live in him. I'm depressed. Then I'm going to open up my heart and I'm crying out to my Savior. I'm crying out to my Lord and saying, Lord, I'm depressed. There's a cloud over me and I can't move this cloud. You remove my sins. I need you to remove my depression and that I'd be restored into the joy of thy salvation. You're king and you're sovereign. You are Lord over my depression. Amen? Preacher, that'll never work. That's why we got psychiatrists. That's why we have Prozac. Whatever your story is, whatever situation you're dealing with, I can tell you a worse one. I can. Whatever difficulties, whatever weights you're carrying, whatever thing you can't work through, I can tell you someone who worked through something far worse. That's the way it always is. You can always find somebody worse off. I say that why? Because if believers of all of history have been able to take some of the most trying circumstances and work through them by leaning upon Christ and do so for His glory, so can you. That this Christ we receive is greater than just our salvation. He is able to deal with the entirety of your life. Death, life, tragedies, heartaches, joys, brokenness, everything that could affect the human life. What I'm trying to tell you is, is that the image of the invisible God is king over all of creation and he is able to deal with whatever you've got. You just need to come and pour it out to him. Or he's not. Or he's not. Either he is or he isn't. Here's a great problem. If Christ is not sufficient to deal with the heart issues of my life, if Christ is not sufficient to help me to work through depressions, anxieties, troubles, and job losses, and cancer, and, and rebellion of children, and, the, and, and any other extremity that would come along, if Christ can't help me with those, if Christ can't strengthen me through those, if Christ can't carry me in the midst of those, then pray tell me who it is that I'm supposed to lean on. And if there's someone else, then what you're telling me is that they have more sufficiency and more power than my king. Whether it's a person, a thing, or an institution, or a set of other things that you want to apply to it, what I'm just trying to reclaim for you is what I believe that the Apostle Paul is saying. Apostle Paul is saying that God of heaven, who spoke everything into existence out of nothing, has come down in human flesh and he is the image of the invisible God and he is the firstborn over all creation. That he is, he is preeminent over everything, everything in heaven and earth, whether visible or invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities. He is over it all. He is before it all. He holds all of it together by himself. Christ does. He holds the entirety of it all. You and the whole sphere of the universe, He holds it together. At the moment Christ took His hand off this universe, it would all fall into this way. He's the head of the body, the church. 
He is the beginning. He's the firstborn from the dead. That in everything he might have preeminence. The fullness of God was pleased to dwell in him. Through him to reconcile all things to himself, whether on earth or in heaven, making peace by the blood of his cross. Church, I just want to remind you that whatever life throws at you, whatever the circumstance is, some of them are bad, some of them are difficult. Some of you have not worked through some things that you're dealing with in your own heart. Some of you have bitterness, some of you have unforgiveness, some of you have struggles, some of you have trials, some of you are just laboring over this thing and that thing, and you just can't ever seem to work it out. All your pastor is saying is that Christ is sufficient for whatever it is. Pour your heart out to him. Lay your cards on the table. Lord Jesus, here is my struggle. Here's my sin. Here's my failure. Here's my shortcomings. Here's my doubts. Here's all the things I just can't get a handle on. Is there any mercy left? Jesus, do you care about me? I I don't even feel like you care. I don't even feel like no one loves me. The whole world is falling apart. Are you there? Jesus receives sinful men. I don't think we've tested him. I don't think we've tested him. I'm telling you ought to test it. I'm telling you that you should have, you ought to have, received Christ as a sufficiency for your life. That's what I'm telling you. I make no apologies about it. When you received Christ, maybe you weren't taught, maybe no one told you. I'm just reminding you now, You should receive Jesus Christ as the sufficient one for your life now and for all of eternity. That I have come to a place that everything that I do falls apart. I can't hold anything together. I'm not able to solve my life. So I'm taking all of my failures and I'm saying, I believe in the person Jesus Christ for the totality of everything of my life for my righteousness, for my comfort, for my refuge, for my eternity, for my hope, for friendship, for relationship, for love, for peace, for comfort, for everything my soul cries out for, I believe Christ provides it. That's how you ought to receive him. It's how you ought to be believed because he is all of that. Now, if you receive him like that, if you receive him as he is defined to be, then live in him that as a christian 47 years into this christianity walking down the road this thing slaps me upside the head that i had no control over i don't know what to do yes i do i'm going to the one who saved me and the one who saved me will keep me the one who keeps me will provide for me and i trust him you imagine you imagine there goes your husband. I've told this story so many times. I've probably told it wrong. I've told it so many times. But you imagine there goes your husband to be burned at the stake because of his position regarding the person of Jesus Christ. I will not recant, he says. I will not recant. They tie him up. They stick the sticks under him. They set it ablaze. And there's the wife. Don't deny the faith. Don't deny the faith. Don't deny the faith. I mean, tell me... <laughs> Here's a woman watching her husband burn to death because of her belief in Jesus Christ, constantly reassuring her husband, don't deny Christ. He is enough. He's enough in death. He's enough for me to be a widow, even though just a few short days later she would be martyred herself for not willing to recant either. They found that even in martyrdom, being burned at the stake or being drowned in the Danube River, that either way, Christ was sufficient. And he is for you. And he is for me. And he is for this church. I just want to remind you that everything the world is selling you on TV and everything that is being sold on the radio and everything that is being sold on your job as how to fix your life and everything that's being printed and wrote on Facebook in order to help you with your life is not going to stand under the test of fire. I want to tell you that whatever your situations are and whatever you're going through, I want to tell you to go to Christ and cry until he answers. 
I want you to go to Him until peace is established in your heart. And if Christ establishes it, it will be established. Watch this. People know about your life. People know you work with, and they see you. All of a sudden, everything on your countenance changes. You, your face changes. Your attitude changes. Everything about you is different than it was last week. And they know that you're going through this gravely difficult time. They say, what in the world? How, how in the world can you wash yourself and come in here and eat? You had not eaten in the last so many days since your baby died. How can you clean up and eat? That's what they asked David, did they not? I can clean up and eat because I know him who reigns. As the new song on the radio says, he is in charge of all the angel armies. He's on my side. Could you imagine walking this week onto your job on Monday, walking into your family this afternoon with joy in your heart, having resolved by faith that I've received Christ and he is enough, and they would say to you, man, you seem to be happy today, and you go, I am. You ever respond that way? Man, you, man, you seem to woke up on the right side of the bed. I did. What side did you wake up on? It don't matter. I woke up with Jesus. Could we not talk that way? Could we respond and say, and say oh, man, I don't see how you're making it. Your wife died. Your husband died. Your kid ran off. This happened. You lost this job over here. Your life's a bunch of mess. How, is it, how come you seem so happy? Because I know him who is over all these things and what the world may mean for my good, I mean for my evil or my bad, God has meant for my good. And I trust him. I know that the one who calls me, I know that the one whom I love, he's going to work everything out for my good because I've been called according to his purpose. I know I've been justified. I know I've been sanctified. I know I've been glorified because the Lord of glory has predetermined and foreknew all of these things and I can trust him. Could we not be that way? I ask you. I, I just scrapped the whole sermon. That's just on my heart this morning. I, I hope it helps somebody. But look, have you received Christ? I'm saying to you this morning, receive him as the one who is completely and totally sufficient for your life. For the rest of eternity, he's sufficient. You say, how in the world do I do that? How in the world does a man, a woman, a person, how do they receive Christ? Believe him that he has done everything that is necessary for your soul. I have no righteousness. I have no good works. I have not enough money. I have not enough intelligence. I don't have anything when I think through it. And I just simply believe that Jesus Christ has paid my debt. I believe that Jesus Christ died for me. He rose from the dead for me. I believe that Jesus Christ is merciful. I believe that if I call upon the name of the Lord, he will save me. I'm crying out for him to be the Lord of my life, the entirety of my life. If Christ can't see me through, I'm not going to make it. Receive Christ that way and then live in Him for the rest of your life. Christian, stop backtracking and leaning upon yourself. You didn't receive Christ that way. You shouldn't have. Don't lean on your intellect, your abilities, your finances, your 401ks, your car, your house, your friends, your spouse, your children, your siblings. Don't lean on those things to hold you up because they won't. Christian, be reminded, as you received Christ, He is the sufficient one. Lean on Him for all of eternity. He will never let you down. Father, thank you for this day. Thank you for your word, God. Help us to receive Christ as we ought to receive him. And Lord, for those of us who have received him, help us once again to believe that he is sufficient for everything our soul needs. Lord, I do pray. Pray specifically and clearly, Lord, for even those in this room who never received Christ in any way. Today, God, that they would believe Him. You would open their eyes to see the beauty of Christ. You'd open their ears to hear the beauty of the gospel. You'd soften their hearts to receive the imprint of Christ upon their soul. Oh God, that today there would be some that would say, Lord Jesus, save me, chief of sinners. And Lord, for this church, FBC Briar, God, help us as a people to model that which we believe in our hearts. 
May we turn our friends, our family, our co-workers to the all-sufficient one. May we turn them there by our words and by our very life's actions. They will see us like Abraham going up the mountain with our son and saying, after we worship, we'll come back. Help us to trust and believe you that even you raise the dead. Help us, oh God, that in the midst of whatever, if a hurricane was to come tomorrow, that Christians would stand with solid resolve. My God made the storm, he produced the storm, and he'll keep us however he so chooses to do so. We trust in him. Help us to have that kind of resolve, God. You are believable, you are sufficient, you are sure and right and good, and there is nothing beyond your power. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.